a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is Sabbath, the 4th of November 2017, and I'm going to record today the seventh part of the wonderful book Martin Luther wrote, and you can even probably call us his legacy, because it's the work, last work that he did in this earthly life, against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil. I do not know how to call the video yet, because I always take one or two sentences out of the reading, and uh, then I'm going to work those into the titles. I did the same in German. Um, but because I have not read what we are going to read right now in preparation, I'm going to read this as cold as you are going to follow it. <laughs> I will probably make the title up later. But um, just a little information that I want to give you. Why am I not uploading only the videos of uh, this Luther book right now? Well, uh, today on the 4th of November there is only one, the final chapter 21, uh, the pictures that I'm missing from All Roads Lead to Rome, because Brett has been very hard working on providing me all the pictures from chapter 16 to 20 on, so that was a lot of work for him, for which I thank him right here, right now. And um, I will thus also upload the last chapters of All Roads Lead to Rome, as in German, as in English, but will continue with this book reading against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil as the prime work before I turn to my next English works um, and videos that I will share with you. So just uh, go a little back uh, where we left off last time on uh, page 299 on the last paragraph we ended last time. I uh, just want to <clears throat> recall into your remembrance what we are speaking of uh, on the bottom of page 298. Luther said, uh, first by proper division and to start at the bottom, it was not instituted, and that is the Roman papacy that he's speaking of, by temporal authority, and even if it had been, it would still have been from the devil. Then the second point that Martin Luther makes is, second, the papacy did not come from spiritual powers either that is, from Christianity and bishops in the whole world, or from the councils. Yeah. They neither are able, nor do they have authority to create the papacy. So this is where Martin Luther refutes the points that the Antichrist always relies on when he says, well, I am the king of the world, and I am the lord of lords, because it has been given to me in the temporal world. First point, Martin Luther refutes that. Then the Pope says, I am the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because it has been given to me by Scripture, by spiritual powers. And Martin Luther refutes that in the second paragraph. Now we're going to continue on the bottom of page 99 in the last paragraph there, where he says, what is the use of more words? The Pope himself refuses to accept that he was established by councils or spiritual sovereigns of Christianity. He rages at it. Oh, how he bellows, rages, raves and foams, just like one possessed by many thousands of devils in his decretals, Decreti Prima Pars 16, 19, and 21, etc., and in the De Electione Significasti, when Antichrist Pope Paschalis II, who reigned between 1099 and 1118, sent the pallium to the Archbishop of Palermo in Sicily, with the condition that he should pledge his loyalty to the Pope in a formal oath, 
and the bishop very humbly replied with only the words that the kings of Sicily and their followers were really amazed that such an oath was required of him, since Christ in Matthew 5 verse 34 had forbidden swearing and one could find no law of the councils condoning it. The holy noble jewel Pascalus was furious. For the bishop had it hit him so hard with the word of Christ that his head spun, and he did not know what to say or how to say it, and he martyred the word of Christ, Matthew 5, like a pope against whom I wrote in Latin twenty-five years ago. I intended to write in German later, if I do not forget it, on account of the many things I still have to do. But at the reference to the council he opened his big mouth, as though he would like to swallow heaven and earth, and roared, Do you think that the councils have authority to set goals for the Roman church? Read, the church of his horse and hermaphrodites. Don't you know that all councils were convened by the Roman church, and have their authority from the Roman church? <laughs> This is the way, this is exactly the way one should lie and blaspheme if one wants to be a proper Pope. Dear God, what an utterly shameless, blasphemous, lying mouth the Pope is. He talks, as just, he talks just as though no man on earth knew that the four principal councils and many others were held without the Roman Church and instead Things like this, quote, as I am a crude ass and do not read the books, so there is no one in the world who reads them. Rather, when I let my brain he have, he or resound or even let out a donkey's fart, then everyone will have to consider it an article of faith. If not, St. Peter and St. Paul and God himself will be angry with them. Unquote. For God is nowhere God anymore, except solely the ass God in Rome, where the big crude ass Pope and Cardinals ride on better donkeys than they are. From all this, you now hear that the papal holy office is not instituted by spiritual authority or by the holy Christian churches of the whole world. That is, it is not of God, for God dwells in Christendom and works through it, nor is it of temporal authority. And papal holiness does not want to be instituted by one of them, or both, as we have learned. Thus he confesses herewith that he does not derive from God, that is, from the Church. And this is certainly, certainly the truth, and we accept it as such. We are in complete agreement with his holiness on these two items, even though he speaks such truth unknowingly, like one possessed, for he means by this to strengthen his lies and blasphemy. Now comes the really main point. Because God has ordained no estates on earth, I do not speak of the estate of marriage and whatever is connected with that, to rule other than these two, namely, the spiritual and the temporal, through which he wishes to help the human race, through the spiritual one to eternal life in heaven, and through the temporal one to finite life on earth. The real question now is, quote, Whence then does the papal office come, since it does not want to come either from spiritual authority, that is, from the Christian church where Christ is, or from temporal authority, that is, from secular sovereigns? Unquote. It cannot come from Never Never Land, for who would be so unreasonable and sin so highly against the Most Holy Father Pope? Dr. Luther is a crude fellow. If he were to hear this asked, he would jump in like a farmer with boots and spurs and say, The Pope has been thrown out of hell! unto the church by all the devils, as was said above. 
for this same abominable, accursed heretic is drowned in the deep error of believing that what God wants to do, he surely does through the two realms, and no one is to set up another one. Well then, joke, lie down. This comes from a German proverb says, Scherz lege dich, and we would today, in these days, 2017, say, all joking aside. <laughs> well then, all jokes aside. Where does the papacy come from? I repeat, it comes from the devil, because it does not come from the church, which Christ rules through his Holy Spirit, and it does not come from temporal authority. I will prove this so thoroughly that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As we can read Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 forthcoming. It says in 1 Peter 4:11, quote, Whoever speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Whoever renders service, let him do it as one who renders it by the strength which God replies, supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, unquote, etc. Also, in many places, St. Paul sharply forbids the teaching of men, especially in Titus 1 in the verses 13 and 14, quote, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith instead of giving heed to commands of men who reject the truth, unquote. And our Lord himself says in Matthew 15, verse 9, quote, In vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines of precepts of men. Unquote. Here it is firmly forbidden to preach or hear human teachings in the church, for they do not give honor and glory to God, but instead seduce people away from the faith and seek the glory of man. A very important sentence that we really have quite well to understand. And of course, I don't like the word a human teaching because human is a term from the papacy. Man is a term from, and mankind is a term from the Bible. You will never find the word human in the Bible. Anyway, he says, and I'm going to repeat the sentence because we really have to listen closely to this to get a, well, a fine understanding of it. Here it is firmly forbidden to preach or hear human or manly teachings in the church, for they do not give honor and glory to God, the teachings of men, but instead seduce people away from the faith and seek the glory of man. What else is the Pope seeking but the glory of man? that when everybody bows down to him and worships him, a mere man, a sinner, who is as bad as we all. We are all born in trespasses and sins. So is the Pope. But his teaching that comes from man, he even puts above the teaching of God. And by that he seduces people away from the faith and seeks the glory of man, because he is the vicarious of the God of this world, Satan, who wants to be worshipped, Isaiah chapter 14. Now Martin Luther continues, For God alone would speak, work, and govern in his church, so that he alone is glorified, which we have, praise God, managed to achieve in our churches. So he is speaking here of the early Lutheran churches. And, with God's help, it has become customary that almost everyone knows how one should beware of the, things, uh, of the teachings of men as of the devil himself, and should hear only our Lord and Savior as the Father tells us of him at the River Jordan. Quote, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Him you shall hear. Unquote. He himself says in John 10, verses 27, My sheep hear my voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Unquote. 
by going among the sheep you may see for yourself, if you wish this sweet and joyful picture that the Lord uses here about them. If a stranger calls, whistles or coaxes them, Herman, Herman, they run and flee. Herman, Herman, I'm just uh, explaining on it to you this two words that Luther says here. This is names given to weather frequent, uh, uh, This is a name given to weathers frequently used in Luther's time. So Herman, Herman, they run and flee, and the more you coax, the more they run, as if a wolf were there, for they do not recognize the strange voice. But when the shepherd lets himself be heard a little, they all run toward him, for they know his voice. Just so should all true Christians act, who hear no voice but that of their shepherd, Christ, as he says himself in John 10, verse 8, quote, All who came before me are thieves and murderers, but the sheep did not heed them. Unquote. From these and many similar sayings, it has been clearly and convincingly enough proven that God has strictly and sharply forbidden the doctrines and works of men in the church, as being contrary to faith and leading men away from the truth, that is, they are sheer lies and fraud before God. And where the devil has gotten involved, that one embellishes them with God's name or the apostle's name and sells them under these names, then they are no longer simple lies and fraud, but also horrible blasphemy, idolatry and abomination. For then the devil makes God the liar and deceiver, as though God has spoken such lies or done such works. And if the people fall for it, believe it and depend on it, as if God had said and done it, and thus they give their trust and honor which is due to God alone, to lies and to the devil. This is what is meant by true idolatry and blasphemy in all the prophets. Isaiah 2 verse 8 says, quote, Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the works of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. Unquote. And Jeremiah 29 verse 31 says, quote, Because Shemaiah has prophesied to you when I did not send him, and has made you trust in a lie, unquote, etc. Now you hear, he who is not sent does not have the word of God, and by his own human doctrine he makes men trust in lies, that is, in other words, he makes them commit idolatry and adultery because when you leave the marriage bed with God you commit adultery the bride is married to Jesus Christ right when this bride goes apostate sleeps with somebody else spiritually it is adultery so I would even be a little bit more harsh than Martin Luther in his own words is here by saying that is commit idolatry. I would even say that is commit adultery. And idolatry, of course. Not the one or the other. No, no, no. Even worse. Both at the same time. Now you hear. He who is not sent does not have the word of God. And by his own man-made doctrine he makes men trust in lies. And when he makes you trust in lies, that is that he makes you commit idolatry and spiritual adultery. Here we come to the really important points. <laughs> As if everything we've read right now was just a warming up. It is now certain, Martin Luther continues, that the Pope and his office is merely a figment of human imagination and invention. For as we have heard, he does not come from, nor wish to come, from the order of temporal authority. He does not and does not wish to come from the order of the church or the councils. Thus, 
one knows for certain that not one letter of God's word will be found by him in scripture. Instead, he placed himself this high by his own arrogance, arbitrariness and malice, then decorated himself with God's word thereby blaspheming abominably and making an idol of himself. Making an idol of himself. Now, where have we read in the Bible about exactly this before? Daniel chapter 2. The statue of gold. Right? Oh no, that wasn't chapter 2. That's... Another chapter, <laughs> you know, where Nebuchadnezzar makes that statue of gold and wants everybody to bow down to him. Let me have a look. Yeah, Daniel chapter 3, of course, right after chapter 2, where the dream is explained and the meaning of it. The next thing that Nebuchadnezzar does is, even though that Daniel tells him that there is a wonderful God in heaven who can tell all the dreams and interp interpretations of them, all of a sudden, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? I don't care what God said. If God said, I am only the head of gold, I want to be the whole statue of gold. And he makes a whole statue of gold and makes everyone in his kingdom to bow down to the sound of the music of this statue. And this is exactly what Martin Luther speaks here about decorates himself with God's words, thereby blaspheming abominably and making an idol of himself, like Nebuchadnezzar did before. Listen, there is nothing new under the sun. The Pope does nothing but every precursor of Antichrist did all throughout history. And who was the oldest precursor of Antichrist? Cain and his descendants and Nimrod in Babylon. Huh? And they were all making idols of themselves. And the Pope does exactly the same thing. Now, you can say, okay, well, where's the statue of the Pope today? It's not per se about a Hoon statue, but a spiritual idol. And that's what the Pope makes. He makes himself a spiritual idol. Because he says that without him and his quote-unquote mother church, there is no salvation for anyone in this world. Thus he makes an idol of himself. And we have numerous examples in the, comp in the whole Bible of other precursors of Antichrist doing the same thing. Now Martin Luther continues, he filled Christendom with his horrible idolatry. He lied, he cheated and made those who believed and trusted this into damned idolaters as though God has, had commanded it in his word. Thus they were compelled to fear, honor, worship and serve the devil in the name of God. There where you have the Pope, what he is, whence he comes, namely as a horror as Christ says in Matthew 24, verse 15, of all idolatry brought forth by all the devils from the depths of hell. Yes, you say, he really claims to come out of God's word and out of God, for in many decretals he quotes the passage in Matthew 16, verse 18, quote, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I will give the thee the keys of the kingdom, etc., etc. That is as much as saying that the Pope in Rome is Lord over all Christendom. Truly, that might do it! Who would have missed such high reason in the Most Holy Father? Someone really should have warned a poor fellow before he sinned so deeply and called the Pope an ass, fool, idol and devil. How fortunate for me that I tightened my belt. I was already getting a laughing fit from my shock over the Pope's great reasoning, and it might easily have happened that I had not been wearing trousers, that I would have made something people don't like to smell. So afraid and awed was I, 
at such papal great wisdom. Yet I wonder why His Holiness has chosen such an obscure saying, when there are so many clearer things in Scripture to suit His purpose, such as first this one, Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. Now, this, what I'm reading to you right now, is a little bit difficult to understand with all the um, Bible quotes therein. So I'm going to read this twice, and the second time you will understand it better. But this time, firstly, I'm going to read this exactly how it is written in the book. And then we will get the understanding of it when we analyze this. So, Martin Luther said, uh, such as first this one, Genesis 1 verse 2, in the beginning, that is in Rome, God created, that is instituted, heaven, that is the Pope, and earth, that is the Christian church. The earth was without form and void, that is the Christian church is subject to the Pope, etc. This saying would have been much more effective. Again, Isaiah 1 verse 3, the ox knows its Lord, that is the Pope in Rome is Lord of all, and the ass its master's crib, that is Christendom, is the Pope's body servant. And scripture is full of sayings that speak much more clearly of the papacy than Matthew 16. The logica and parva logicalia would also help here as no one and nobody bites into his own sack. That is, the Pope is the Lord and Master of the Church. Again, the hypothetical proposition, that is, the Pope, is clothed in a categorical cap, that is, in the city of Rome, cap meaning head, yeah, sits on the Porphyrian tree, that is, the head of the universal church, and devours all living things, that is, he has the power to violate laws. And so it continues to be written, painted, given, and pictured in all creatures, that the Pope in Rome is chief, lord, and judge over everything in heaven and earth. Now, before we continue, I'm going to give you a little explanation of that, that we read it the way that we should really understand it. Yet I wonder, Martin Luther said, why His Holiness has chosen such an obscure saying, when there are so many clearer things in Scripture to suit His purpose, such as this one, in Genesis 1-2, in the beginning, and that is meaning Rome, God created, meaning instituted heaven, that is the Pope, and earth, that is the Christian church. So, by that it's meaning, when there are so many clearer sayings in scripture to suit this purpose, such as first this one. In the beginning, in Rome, instituted, God instituted the Pope in the Christian Church. Okay? This is how we should understand this reading. The earth was without form and void. That means the Christian Church is subject to the Pope, etc. Now, this saying would have been much more effective. The ox knows its Lord. That means the Pope in Rome is Lord over all. Huh? So, the Christian Church is subject to the Pope. The Pope in Rome is Lord over all. And Christendom is the Pope's body servant. Christendom is the Pope's body servant. The hypothetical proposition, that means the Pope, is closed in the categorical cap, that is the city of Rome, the Pope is clothed in the city of Rome. He is the head of the universal church and he devours all living things, meaning that he has the power to violate laws. Why? Well, because the people who make laws don't make the laws to string themselves or to put themselves under these laws, but everybody else. Yeah? That's why you see, and, that, and that's why the Bible says, by their fruits you will know them, you know. Do as I say, don't do as I do, right? Because the people who make the laws are the people who are perpetrating the laws, are the people who 
do not adhere to the laws that they make. They are free of these laws. They make the laws just for, quote unquote, us, for the lay people. They don't need to adhere to these laws. They have immunity, diplomatic immunity, or immunity because they are in the Senate or in the Bundestag or wherever. They are immune. Or they are from the clergy, and by that they fall under Roman Catholic canon law, and they cannot be persecuted by the civil law. So all these laws adhere just to the quote-unquote sheep, and not to the quote-unquote shepherd. Okay? So, in this we have to understand what Martin Luther writes here on page 304. In the beginning, that is in Rome, God created or instituted heaven, that is the Pope, and the earth, that is the Christian Church. Yeah? In the beginning, Rome instituted the Pope and the Christian Church. The earth was without form and void, that is, the Christian Church is subject to the Pope. And the Pope in Rome is Lord over all, and Christendom is the Pope's body servant. That's the way Martin Luther meant this here. So we're going to continue then. For in ex si solite de majoritate, so this is a decree of um, Pope uh, Gregory the Ninth, uh, a letter of Innocent the Third to Emperor Alexius the Third. What Martin Luther uh, puts up here: For in ex si solite de majoritate, the most holy Father Pope, the most hellish Father Pope, in order to interpret the Scripture in this way and defend the papacy, writes to the Emperor in Constantinople. Quote, didn't you read that God created two great, light, two great lights, the sun and the moon? The sun, that is the Pope, and the moon, that is the Emperor. To the extent that the sun is greater than the moon, the Pope is greater than the Emperor. That is, the Pope is, at the gloss cleverly, uh, as the gloss cleverly calculates, 47 times greater than the Emperor. That will be a fine title, Pope, when he is fully grown. Listen, reader, you must not laugh here, or you might get a laughing fit too, like me, and if your breeches do not fit tightly, you too would create a fearful smell that one would have to disperse with incense and juniper, and the Most Holy Father, or the Most Hellish Father, would never forgive you your stinking sin, not even if you were in the throes of death. So beware of laughing in such serious matters, and remember that the Pope is not joking or failing in his interpretation of Scripture, as you see here. But before I point to the Christian understanding of this passage, I must first tell this joke. The glosses, considerandum, and here we come into a footnote, considerandum and abbas asignafastici. Um, uh, says that this passage in Matthew 16 does nothing to confirm the papacy, but rather it is confirmed by the passage in the last chapter of John, Pasche Oves Mias, Feed My Lambs. So the Pope and his lawyers are in disagreement as to what the papacy is based on. The Pope says it is based on Matthew 16 and screams it in many decretals. His lawyers say no. And so the servant charges the Lord with lying, and the Lord charges the servant. May the devil here get into their squabble. In the meantime, we shall let them squabble, and not recognize the Pope as Pope until they have reached an agreement. Although, speaking legally, if I were a lawyer, it seems to me that the lawyers have a better case than the Pope because they base their arguments on the fact that in Matthew 16 Christ did not give the keys to St. Peter, 
but only promised them. Thus, the Pope should have to prove that they were given to him. We theologians can help out the lawyers with arguments like the following, if the Pope should wish to damn them. To Christians it is not enough that one refers to the prophets who promised Christ, but one must also repent, uh, present the apostles who testify that the promise was fulfilled and the promised Christ had come, it, had come and was given. Thus, the Pope is also duty-bound not to quote the promise Matthew 16, but to present a clear text showing that this promise has been fulfilled, and St. Peter has been ordered into the office. This is where the Pope's trousers will stink. For where in the world will he find a text that clearly states that Christ gave the keys to St. Peter? That is the proof he owes, according to the verdict of his own lawyers, and no letter in scripture speaks of the keys outside of Matthew chapter 16. Because the Pope grabbed the keys of St. Peter for himself before he, proved, before he proved his claim, and he can never prove it, it follows that he has, like a villain, stolen what is not his, or that they must be false, painted keys, which are nothing but a picture, and we are free to believe nothing from him, the desperate liar and scoundrel, yes, the spirit of a devil. Moreover, we may, with a good conscience, take his coat of arms, which features the keys and his crown to the privy, use it for wiping, and then throw it into the fire. <laughs> into the fire. It would be better if it were the Pope himself. Now, in German, Martin Luther was a little bit more picture-speaking, saying, I'm going to repeat this last sentence, Moreover, we may, with a good conscience, take his coat of arms, means the flag of the Vatican, you know, with the two keys and the tiara on it, which features the keys and his crown to the privy, to the privy, to the toilet. Use it for wiping our asses and then throw it into the fire. That is how Luther meant this to be understood. Take the Vatican flag with the symbols of temporal and spiritual power of the papacy Take it to the bathroom and wipe your ass with it. And after that, of course, you can burn it. Because, you know, at the time when Luther lived, there was no water closet that we have today. So, <laughs> you better burn that flag right away before it starts stinking around. To deal so falsely and blasphemously with God's word in such important things concerning all of Christendom is to instigate idolatry, which no finite punishment can avenge. God must himself punish it in deepest hell. Meanwhile, a good Christian, whenever he sees the Pope's coat of arms, should spit and throw filth at it, just as one could spit and throw filth at an idol to the glory of God. For such a paper coat of arms is a public lie, and the devil's image, which the people have vainly feared and depended on, as though it were God's commandment, when it is sheer lies, it is sheer blasphemy and arch-idolatry. This, I say, follows from the best confessions of his very own lawyers, since they say the text in Matthew 16 does not contribute to the existence of the papacy. This is like saying that the Pope lies and blasphemes when he applies Matthew 16 to his worthless, blasphemous papacy, and out of this he makes his accursed coat of arms and crown in order to frighten the world and subject it to himself and to capture and corrupt the consciences which he had been redeemed and freed through Christ's blood. To capture
capture and corrupt the consciences which had been redeemed and freed through Christ's blood. He takes them and dips them in their in his blasphemous lies. And we have the Bible to prove the Pope wrong. And we should protest the Pope again. The Pope makes such high claims for this text in Matthew chapter 16 that in Omnes de Sancti Sancta he dares to bellow that the Roman Church alone and none other none other but the Roman Church alone was instituted by God himself. Okay. I do agree. The Church of Rome was instituted by God himself. But we are speaking of the God of this world, Satan. We are speaking of the dragon who, according to Revelation 13, gives the beast its power, and not the God of the Bible. The other churches were instituted by the Roman Church, and God gave the Roman Church the privilege before others of having power over heavenly and earthly kingdoms. And he who breaks away from other churches does a great wrong. But he who breaks away from the Roman church is a heretic, and much more of the same. Now because his own lawyers say no to this, and regard these things as lies, what shall we theologians do, who have to see and hear such big lies embellished with God's word? We say, it is a horrible blasphemy, indeed idolatry, for as we heard above, there is quite a difference between false action and false teaching, and a bigger difference between simple teaching without the word of God and false teaching embellished with God's word. Whoever thus lies in teaching and quotes God's word, for it makes the devil into God and God into the devil, as though God spoke the devil's lies and seduces me to honor and worship the devil in God's name and regard the lies as truth. This, my dear brethren, is what we have to deal with since the Counter-Reformation, if not even before the Reformation in the Dark Ages also, but in a much higher gear since the Counter-Reformation. So I'm going to repeat this last sentence to you. Listen closely. Whoever thus lies in teaching and quotes God's word, for it makes the devil into God and God into devil, as though God spoke the devil's lies and seduces me, Martin Luther says, and seduces all of us to honor and worship the devil in God's name and regard the lies as truth making what is written in the Jesuit oath valid for everybody. Because in the Jesuit oath, as you know, it is stated that when the Roman Catholic hierarchy tells you that white is black and black is white, it is the way that you see it as a Jesuit. Now, when you go away from the colors and you replace black and white, uh, white and black with truth and lie, then we have exactly what Martin Luther condemns already here in 1545. Yeah? And regard the lies as truth. That is the world that we are living in today. We are told in this quote-unquote system that we are living in, especially when you watch television and follow the print media, we are sold lies for truth. We are sold Satan's words for God's words so that we would bow down and worship the one who presents all these lies to us without knowing it, uh, without knowing it. and by that we worship the devil. When we listen 
to the Roman Catholic Church, when we listen to the Pope, when we listen to the media, when we listen to our politicians, when we are not listening to the Bible, because only there the truth is to be found. That's the point Martin Luther makes here. The Pope has filled the world with such innumerable blasphemous idolatries. Oh, Emperor, King, Princes and Lords, and anyone who can take hold, now take hold! God will not bring luck to lazy hands. God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who pick up His Word and study it daily and edify themselves through the Holy Spirit in the Word of God and in the teaching of the God, the Creator of this world, and not the Pope who resembles another God. First, one should deprive the Pope of Rome, Romana, Upino, Bologna, and everything he possesses as Pope, for he is owner of the worst faith. He has it through lies and fraud. Oh, uh, why did I say lies and fraud? He has it through blasphemy and idolatry. He has abominably stolen from the empire, robbed and subjected it to himself. And as reward for this, he has seduced countless souls into eternal hellfire through his idolatry. And he himself boasts, See, Papa! And he has destroyed Christ's realm for which he is called a horror of desolation, in Matthew 24, verse 15. Then we should take him, the Pope, the Cardinals, and whatever riffraff belongs to his idolatrous and papal holiness, and, as blasphemers, tear out their tongues from the back and nail them on the gallows, in order in which they hang their seals on the bulls. Even though all this is mild compared to their blasphemy and idolatry, then one could allow them to hold a council, or as many they wanted on the gallows, or in hell among all the devils. For they did not begin this loathsome papacy in ignorance or weakness. They knew quite well that their predecessors, St. Gregory, Pelagius, Cornelius, Fabian, and many other holy bishops of the Roman Church never practiced such a horror as declared above. They knew very well that St. Cyprian, Augustine, Hilary, Martin, Ambrose, Jerome, Dionysius, and many other holy bishops in all the world had known nothing of the papacy, had not been subject to the Roman Church. They knew well that the four great councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon, and many other councils, had never acknowledged such a papal horror. Oh, what more shall I say? They knew well, and still know well, that the whole of Christendom in the world has no sovereigns except solely our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom St. Paul calls the head of his body, which is all of Christendom, as we read in Ephesians 4:15 through 16 and many other places. They still know well today that Christians in the whole of the Orient are not subject to the Pope. They know well that they have not a single word of God in their favor, but everything against them. Yet, they are such outrageous, shameless blockheads that they instigated consciously and knowingly the loathsome, blasphemous, idolatrous papacy against the strong testimony and admonition of their conscience, the whole world, and all of Scripture. Moreover, till, uh, moreover they still maintain it, while at the same time they condemn as heretics all their predecessors before Boniface the Third. You know, we went into the story of Boniface the Third, Gregory the Great before him, and Emperor Phocas, and the 606 1866 fact. Moreover, they still maintain it, while at the same time they condemn as heretics all their predecessors before Boniface III, along with the whole of Christendom, 
which existed for 600 years before the Pope, including all the Holy Fathers and Councils and all the Christians who have existed these 1500 years up to the present day in the lands of the East. Now here, of course, I have to disagree with Martin Luther, and um, I did that already in the past, but I'm going to tell you once again why I think that this needs a little bit more edification, what I just read to you. Because Martin Luther here still is of the opinion that the Roman Catholic Church, between the time of 321, to make it short, when Emperor Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity, until the time of Pope Boniface III, in 606, became the first pope, the universal bishop, that every bishop in between was actually a bishop of the true Church of Jesus Christ. And that is something where I have to correct Martin Luther here. Because the Church of Jesus Christ was never in the Church of Rome. So the latest, if not even before, and in my humble opinion it was even at the time before, but the latest in 321, when Constantine baptized the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity, that quote-unquote true church was apostate. And I even go so far to say that the apostasy even was much, much earlier. Because even the Apostle Paul warns in Second Thessalonians 2 that the ministry of, uh, of iniquity does already work. Why does it already work? Well, when you read letters to the Corinthians and Galatians and Ephesians with the real understanding that they are written, you will learn, you will absolutely learn and understand that even after founding these churches, they already fell back into man-made traditions. They fell away from the gospel that Paul taught them. And Paul speaks about that in Galatians, for example. Just read through it. And in Ephesians also, he speaks about that. Read through it with the right edification and you will understand it. The problem is that the apostasy came much earlier into the church than most people even understand. Even Martin Luther did not completely understand that the church away from the first century means during the second century after, uh, in, the, in the hundreds that these churches already were becoming apostate. And out of these churches in that time already people separated themselves and those people fled into the wilderness and became later people like the Albigenses and the Waldenses, just to name these two, because there are so many people that we could name. I don't even have all the names right here, but it's a list of more than 20, I can assure you. And those had always saved the true gospel. What we are reading about here, this quote-unquote body of the church, has been apostate more or less from the very beginning. And Martin Luther doesn't see it that way. Why? I don't know. I don't know. The point is also not to, you know, charge Martin Luther with a mistake here or with a fault, but just to acknowledge from our point, the viewpoint that we have today to see that Martin Luther was an error here. Probably not because he wanted to be an error, but just because he didn't have the right understanding at all of the true body of Christ. To me, even the churches during the 2nd and the 3rd century were already becoming apostate. And especially in the 4th century, after 321. All the councils that Luther is uh, counting up here, yeah, 
We were speaking about the councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon. All these councils were absolutely apostate when you compare to the true body of Christ. The quote-unquote real apostolic Bible teaching church. Yeah? So that's why he says, Moreover, they still maintain it, while at the same time they condemn as heretics all their predecessors before Boniface III, along with the whole of Christendom, which existed for 600 years before the Pope, including all the Holy Fathers and Councils and all the Christians who have existed these 1500 years up to the present day in the lands of the East, where the papacy is an article of faith. And such an important necessary article as the Pope bellows in all his decretals, basing his claim on Matthew 16, it is certain that St. Augustine and St. Cyprian, indeed, all the apostles and all of Christendom in the world for over 1500 years must be heretics and eternally damned, and along with them Christ himself who taught them these wicked heresies through his Holy Spirit. No one has been saved or become holy except the papal Christians. A pope has the perfect right to make such a judgment, and if he does not dare to speak such a verdict, he should not be pope. With this, I'll end my reading today on the bottom of page 309. It's quite a little bit that we have to process in our minds. It was not an easy reading. It was full of information and very, very powerful. And that's why I love to read this book. Luther really calls a spade a spade. He is not shy of words. And I think that is absolutely necessary also. I don't want to sound politically correct. I want to sound biblically correct. And with that, I leave you, my dear brethren, until the next time, and the eighth reading of this wonderful work of Martin Luther, his legacy, against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil from 1545. Thanks for watching and listening and commenting. And until next time, Jörg from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye bye. <laughs>